Good afternoon. Thanks for coming today to the Academy to experience the CareStream event in its fullest sense. So we appreciate that. The, uh, I'm a foot and ankle specialist. Uh, I've been uh, in practice 28 years and involved in a lot of uh, innovation, technology changes, education and research. And I would have to say that this is one of the most exciting innovations to come into the world of extremity reconstruction, um, probably in the last 20 years. Uh, if we reflect back at our last imaging technology explosion, that was probably through the MRI. And when that came out, people were thinking, well, this is expensive, it's not really necessary, I'm a great clinician, I can make those diagnoses, and therefore I don't really need this technology. And uh, certainly our leaders in our field that were taking the MRIs more seriously uh, advance their knowledge, advance their capabilities as clinicians, advance their knowledge of pathology, and subsequently turn that into better treatments for patients as a result of focusing on a newer imaging technology that no one really imagined would have a role, but ultimately now is a dominant imaging technique that we use in foot and ankle, besides x-ray of course. Um, I think that uh, ultrasound is fantastic as well, but we, we don't get the information that we do with the CAT scan through an ultrasound or through MRI. So I think this is a very exciting opportunity. Um, conventional CAT scans are used in foot and ankle routinely. I think they are uh, being looked at now more and more as a way to judge healing. Uh, but we now have way more that we can do with CAT scans than we used to. And what I'd like to do is talk about what it means to me as a foot and ankle surgeon to have access to a weight-bearing CAT scan, what the, what the world will look like perhaps in five or 10 years. Uh, giving this technology I think is uh, very um, open and uh, very exciting, very inspirational. But right now the reality is we already have something that is fantastic, but the future will be even greater. So this is the uh, machine, this was uh, one of the uh, earlier versions, this is uh, Jeff from Hopkins, Jeff C. Wearson, who is uh, a PhD working on the technology. We helped him with some of the uh, dimensions uh, and some of the issues that we were looking at for using the weight-bearing CAT scan for foot and ankle. Uh, these are some of my current fellows. Uh, this is another feature of the weight-bearing CAT scan is that when it's not in use, it actually doubles as an exercise platform. And when I say platform, I mean a whole host of things that you could do in an exercise fashion to work your body out and to get perhaps greater, greater cardiovascular fitness than you would with maybe 15 minutes on a treadmill or an exercise bike. Five minutes on this, it's equivalent. Anyway, in, in, but seriously, folks. So uh, I'm going to show you some of the uh, technology that goes behind the weight-bearing CAT scan that has made some of our imaging uh, exceptional at this point. So I'd like to thank some of our co-developers here. Uh, one thing that I had nothing to do with, of course, I had nothing to do with any of the advanced technology, just the foot and ankle specific uh, shape and size issues. But this CAT scan device can give us better soft tissue resolution than what we're used to seeing with a conventional CAT scan. And so you can see on these imaging that you wouldn't necessarily need an MRI in this case. So when you're looking at bone morphology uh, and bone density and bone alignment, you're also getting a lot of information on soft tissues, ligaments and tendons that you can't necessarily get with a conventional CAT scan. Um, also, your bone visibility, as you can see here, looking at the cyst, looking at the osteophytes, looking at the finer details, uh, that is all possible with the CAT scan. Obviously, you get information with the MRI and the soft tissues, but you do get here, I think, the perfect world combination of excellent bone visibility with outstanding features of soft tissue visibility. <clears throat> We could also use the CAT scan like we use a standard CAT scan. You don't have to think about it only as a weight-bearing CAT scan. You should think of it as a CAT scan that you have in your office for your patients at that time. And one of the things that's very critical is when could I return to work? When can I advance in my therapy? 
And we answer that question based on two-dimensional x-rays and some other clinical characteristics. But now we can specifically look at the extremity. And uh, with radiation that's incredibly low dose, it's uh, about five to 10 times more than an x-ray and about one-tenth or so that of a conventional CT. Um, the, uh, you can get the images of the ankle. You can see the early callus formation here and, and follow it at nine weeks and at 15 weeks. And if this person wanted to return to work safely, you'd want to be certain that you have excellent uh, healing before you release them. And that we see that with the CAT scans. We also have other uh, imaging technologies here that are part of the, uh, the device, and that is we have great uh, artifact reduction so that when you're looking at your fixation technique and you're looking at what's going around that technique, you can see um, a lot better than you would with a conventional MRI based on the algorithms they've used here. Um, as I mentioned, we have uh, improved soft tissue imaging, and we have the ability to get a quantitative CT that is not typical that you would get adequate information with a conventional uh, CAT scan. And these are just some studies showing that with this CAT scan we have uh, the resolution to see um, the uh, tissues, uh, the bony tissues in a better way than we would normally do with uh, a conventional CAT scan. Look at this micro CT. Look at the resolution here. This is a standard CT and you can see it's, it's pixelated, it's blurry. You, you can't really make out the trabeculations. Uh, but look at the, the, uh, the CAT scan here. Uh, this is our, our machine, and you can see that it's almost exactly the same detail, and by numbers is the same detail as a micro CT. So the implications are that we have way more information to provide for the practitioners than a conventional CT. And, um, this was all proven out with uh, extensive testing. Um, one other nice uh, feature is that we can look at morphology of the joint. And this is something that we don't really focus on. We look at x-rays and we look at the uh, MRI and we say, okay, yeah, 50% of the joint's involved and it looks like there's no cartilage, there's bone bruising on the MRI. But what we really can't see is exactly the mapping of the cartilage and bone, where it is thin where it is most dense, where is the cartilage eroded, where is it 50% eroded, where is it 80% erosion. These could all be detailed and mapped. And then you could look at it and say, okay, is this a case based on my conventional wisdom, x-rays, clinical exam, MRI, is this a case that I do an osteotomy on? And you, you'd come to your determination, but you might be able to start to uh, put this into your algorithm as well and then come up with a protocol that says, okay, look, if it's 50% of the posterior medial condyle and another 20% anterior to it or a centimeter around it, maybe that's a great case for an osteotomy. Well, you could put it out there, do your osteotomy, follow it, and get a CAT scan postoperatively and see whether you were correct. So you could refine your, your techniques based on this technology and predict, perhaps, that this case would be a fantastic case for an osteotomy or hemiarthroplasty, or it meets the criteria of a total knee based on X, Y, and Z that we have now defined. So I think as this is a very exciting element that we could use for knees, ankles, subtalar joints, um, and in the upper extremity to a lesser degree just based on CAT scan. But this weight bearing in the knees and foot and ankle is particularly unique and I think very advantageous in terms of our future techniques and technology. So in conclusion, just the core technology here, it's a dedicated musculoskeletal machine. Uh, it's portable. Uh, it actually can roll into an elevator. It can be set up. It's, uh, it plugs into uh, an outlet. Uh, you have advanced image capabilities, you have artifact correction, you have middle artifact reduction, you have excellent soft tissue discrimination, you have a quantitative CT to judge bone density, and uh, you have the morphology uh, that you could look at and judge the procedure before and after um, it's been performed. So I think this is very exciting and will hone in um, our skills and help us to create additional uh, more useful technologies and techniques. Now specifically in the foot and ankle, I wanted to look at the flat foot, which we published some literature on, 
syndesmotic injuries, which is coming out soon, and then weight-bearing alignment for arthritic cases. So this was just published in uh, JBJS, and if you're interested in this, you should look at the article. This was uh, led by Cesar, Cesar Donetto, who is a, uh, one of our future uh, fellows. He was a research fellow with me, and he's now at Special Surgery doing his fellowship and will be joining us next year. Uh, he put a tremendous amount of work into quantifying what is the flat foot. What are the angles that we need to look at in a three-dimensional system? Because most of the time we're looking at drawing lines on a two-dimensional representation of the three-dimensional structure, the weight-bearing x-rays. And that's the standard that we've evaluated for our pre-op and post-operative cases. But now we're going to have this three-dimensional information. We have to determine what the axes are that we will use reproducibly to determine the features of that flat foot. So here you see non-weight-bearing versus weight-bearing, the talonavicular uncoverage. This is one of the things we look at on the x-ray. But here you can see very nicely we have very specifically identified the talus first metatarsal angle, and we could see the altered angle, non-weight-bearing versus weight-bearing. Talonavicular coverage, another common thing that we look at on the CAT scans, where now, on the x-rays, we now can look at on the CAT scans in a three-dimensional format. Four-foot arch angle, looking at the angle of the arch relative to the floor non-weight-bearing versus weight-bearing. You see it's lowered down, consistent with a flat foot. The arch height, the navicular to skin distance, drop down again with the weight-bearing. Navicular to floor distance, drop down with the weight-bearing. Uh, also, medial cuneiform to skin, medial cuneiform to floor, all drop down with the weight-bearing CT, all reproducible measurements. And not only did we look at that, we also looked at whether it was reliable as well as reproducible. So many different visits to these images by many different observers will come up with consistent numbers. Also, you can see in the flat foot, the calcaneal fibular distance here, non-weight bearing, you see a little gap there. And when you look at the weight bearing, you see that's closed down, the calcaneus is sitting higher or the fibula is sitting lower, and you have a, quite a change in the morphology of that flat foot. More angles talus first metatarsal angle, navicular to skin distance, and uh, medial cuneiform, and so on and so forth. These, all these standard ways to look at a flat foot have been codified to be reproducible uh, and reliable measurements of looking at the flat foot with the weight-bearing CAT scan. Uh, we also can look at the subtalar horizontal angle and again determine exactly where the deformity is occurring and where you could reproducibly measure it. Uh, as I mentioned, we looked at the reliability of these measurements, looking at people of different skill level and, and having them do the, the measurements. We also looked at a comparison of what we see clinically and what we uh, know is happening on the CAT scan. So you can see here the clinical alignment, and this is the clinical alignment on a weight-bearing CAT scan, and then we peel away the tissues and we go look at the Achilles to calcaneal tuberosity line, which is perhaps a better way to more objectively assess what the angle is. But even more objectively is just to look purely at the bony alignment and to determine what the axis of that foot is. How much valgus is there is probably most directly reproducible with this, act, this alignment technique versus the clinical alignment. But this helps me to calibrate. So when I look at this and I say, okay, that's 15 degrees, and I get a weight-bearing CAT scan, I see, okay, that's 16 degrees, okay, I'm pretty close. Um, and we could do this uh, over and over again in the clinic, and I, I think it makes us better clinicians. And here you could see an example of one where we have a more severe uh, malalignment, again, several different ways to, to do the measurement. Which one seems to correlate best with the clinical alignment? Uh, that's uh, probably the tibial uh, axis of Taylor joint angle. Uh, with 90% uh, intra-observer um, and 0.79 uh, intra-observer reliability. Um, also looking at which uh, clinical alignment, uh, which, which correlates best with what we see on clinical alignment. You can see the different measurements. That doesn't mean these measurements are bad. It just means that these are maybe what we should be focusing on versus the clinical alignment. What is more reproducible ultimately is going to be better. Um, 
Syndesmotic measurements we thought would be very interesting and uh, indeed has a lot of relevance clinically. It's a very hard area to tell when it's gray, and I think we see a lot of gray. Oftentimes when you have a mesonew fracture, you see a wide diastasis. Everyone knows that that's blown apart. But when it's reduced, is it truly reduced? If you're taking a two-dimensional representation of something that has a lot of variability in terms of rotational and translational dimensions, you can get lost in the sauce and leave a patient with a malreduced syndesmosis. So these are standard measurements that we've come up with off the literature to reproducibly demonstrate the syndesmotic features that can be measured and then could be talked about for clinical guidelines and to assess outcomes of surgery. So um, here's just ways, the, kind of the protocol for where we go one centimeter above the joint in all the different planes to determine your measurements. So these are very consistent techniques um, that people can follow even with medical school background. They're able to do it even if they haven't used, uh, done radiology as a rotation. Um, so these are just looking at the various alignments, looking at the edge of the fibula relative to the anterior tibia, looking at the space, um, looking at the uh, space by doing a bisector line through the fibula and through the uh, posterior and anterior aspects of the incisura and measuring that angle. And these are, again are measurements that are in the literature that we can reliably find with our uh, weight-bearing CAT scan looking at the angle that is uh, subtended between the line that goes along the fibula to the front of the talus to the tibia and along the posterior aspect of the fibula to the back of the tibia what is that angle uh, that will give you a sense of the uh, displacement laterally of the fibula also you could look at the measurement between the anterior part of the fibula and the posterior part of the fibula and the tibia and usually this is the normal variability is that it's wider posteriorly. So now um, I'm going to give credit to two of my foreign fellows and one of the uh, Hopkins residents that I worked with, and a, uh, Dr. Imam, who is a radiologist at Hopkins, looking at these measurements and proving that we have good reliability and reproducibility. Um, and that's what we found in this paper that will be published soon. This angular measurement, I think, is particularly good and useful. Um, again, as this fibula displaces laterally, your angle becomes more uh, acute, more narrow. As this fibula goes in, your angle becomes larger. And it's a very good, easy measurement technique. I like it because it's, it's quick to the eye, um, and we found that that was very helpful. These are other measurements, and I don't want to go through this in great detail, but these measurements are very useful in looking at the syndesmosis, and they all could be part of your algorithm for assessing it. Ultimately, we will have in the system programs that will permit these measurements to be done more automatically, so you don't have to actually trace them out. Um, a, an experienced tracer can move through this quickly. Uh, as a clinician, you know, you have to be trained to that, and I think if, if you don't have time, that might be uh, a little cumbersome, but certainly, uh, with the software improvements that are coming down the pike, we will be able to get these measurements printed out for you, and, as well as a visual image to show you whether you have a disruption of the clear space, whether you have widening of the medial clear space versus the lateral. You can see uh, the numbers here should be consistent from side to side. And these measurements, again, these are publishable. If anybody wants these slides to show these measurements, I'm happy to share them with you. You can also look at Taylor tilt, fibular length. All these are reproducibly measured uh, using the weight-bearing CAT scan. So this is uh, a lot of detail, but basically shows that we are able to define it and reproducibly um, measure it. And uh, depending on uh, skill set, we get very high consistency uh, with the readings. Um, now, looking at the, uh, the space, we are going to be following these alterations and see whether it goes to lead to ankle arthritis so that there will be clinical relevance to deciding whether we should fix certain things based on these dimensions. I want to show you some cases uh, because I think this is, uh, brings it home the best. This is a 65-year-old woman, lateral this fracture. She had a negative stress x-ray. Uh, she was treated conservatively. 12 weeks later, she's still symptomatic. 
a weight-bearing CAT scan was ordered, and you can see here's the normal side weight-bearing, and here's the affected side weight-bearing, okay? Now here's that angle that I talked about before, so the normal side weight-bearing is a 62-degree angle, the affected side weight-bearing is 56 degrees, so that's a more acute angle which means that that fibula is squ being squirted out of the incisura. So you've got a winding of your syndesmosis space, and this angle, again, is very reproducible. And here's the affected, a normal side versus affected side non-weight bearing, and you can see that the angle is almost the same. Even though it does look abnormal, the angle's the same, and so this one is, um, with weight bearing, a very good demonstration of the increased difference from side to side in the weight-bearing CAT scan. This is a 25-year-old male, SER uh, injury, supination, external rotation injury. He had positive stress x-ray. He had a proximal RIF, so this is a amazing new type fracture. We did a uh, stress view, which was negative following the fixation. And the patient was still symptomatic with pain and inability to weight bear. And the MRI was inconclusive, which we'd expect, because an MRI is going to show you the soft tissues. It doesn't show you the integrity of the soft tissue. It doesn't show you their ability to hold the fibula in place. So um, with this weight-bearing CAT scan, you can see affected side versus a normal side. And you see four millimeter space between the fibula and tibia versus 2.6 millimeters. And so with weight-bearing, you see uh, that this uh, space is greater on the affected side versus non-affected side. On the, on the non-weight bearing, we have 3.5 millimeters non-weight bearing affected versus non-affected uh, non-weight bearing, 2.6 millimeters. So less dramatic, certainly more dramatic with the weight bearing. Again, showing the features of the weight bearing CAT scan and coming up with a treatment plan for the patient. So, 27-year-old man with a Weber B fracture, they're not supposed to have syndesmotic injuries, but they do. 25% of them will actually have a syndesmotic injury. He was treated non-operatively, and here you can see on the affected weight-bearing side that the fibula is sitting anteriorly. It's translated anteriorly relative to the incisora, and here you see uh, the affected side non-weight-bearing sitting more posteriorly. Again, you could do this and compare it to the other side if there's a question, but this is a very nice demonstration of something that would not be seen on a stress view or not necessarily be seen on a regular x-ray. Case four, there's this 57-year-old woman, trimalleolar fracture, she had ORIF, positive stress x-ray with syndesmotic fixation. We did an evaluation of the range of motion and syndesmotic measurements before and after syndesmotic screw removal, and here you see before the hardware removal, dorsiflexion, before the hardware removal, neutral, and you see that that distance doesn't change a lot. It's uh, 4.7 to 3.5. After hardware removal, we go from a 6.2, which is a very dramatic difference, and then um, it's kind of sprung out and stayed out. So percentage-wise, it was really a pretty unstable syndesmosis to begin with. Hardware removal really brought that out, and uh, in neutral position versus dorsiflexion, you see a change in the position. After hard remover neutral was 5.1, in dorsiflexion, it became uh, even greater. Case five, a 62-year-old male, right ankle pain following a supination external rotation injury, no fracture detected, uh, negative stress x-ray, non-operative treatment, non-weight bearing, looks pretty good. And this is a CAT scan, so you should, you know, this should really be a lot of detail. You do weight bearing and you see this very subtle instability. Now, for a young person that may be an athletic career or no athletic career, I mean, this could be a game changer. 62 year old, I mean, that's not so far away from my age, maybe, but I think that this may not have as, as dire a consequences, but if certainly if this person, 62 year old, wanted to perform on Fenway stage, they might have trouble. And that could be pretty significant for somebody. Anyway, it's, uh, it's this case six, a 58-year-old woman, right ankle fracture, negative stress x-ray, uh, conservative treatment was instituted. Here you see non-weight bearing. It looks pretty good. With weight bearing, look what happened to the fibula. It went posteriorly. I mean, you can't usually see that on an x-ray. That's very hard to see. I mean, you could see it on an AP, maybe a mortise view. But to see this, you have to have a CAT scan.
Um, case seven, this is a, a Weber B fracture, 27-year-old, non-operative treatment, non-weight-bearing versus weight-bearing, increased anterior and lateral translation of the distal fibula. You could also use this technology to look at OCD and arthritis to determine alignment and then to determine your plan of action. Now, this is an extreme case, but you can imagine one that's more subtle where you're trying to figure out, should I just do a fibular osteotomy to breed the syndesmosis, to breed the deltoid, reconnect the deltoid after a fibular osteotomy, which lengthened and rotated the fibula, or is this too far gone? Should this go right to an ankle replacement? Um, Non-weight-bearing versus weight-bearing, you see the true impact of these lesions. You see the talus is abutting against the fibula, the medial clear space is greater, the syndesmosis is greater, and you have the talus sitting in this invagination in the tibia, and that is a more severe case than what you'd see with a conventional imaging or a conventional CAT scan. And again, determining your treatment alternatives, you can still do your reconstruction, and you can now follow it and see if your prognosis is good before you do your case, if it has more than 25% involvement, maybe the prognosis is questionable. Maybe if it looked like this with the weight bearing, you'd have a better prognosis. These studies need to be done and will be now done with the weight bearing CAT scan. Uh, we could also do similar things with subtalar arthritis, weight bearing versus non-weight bearing, looking at the alignment and looking at the impingement between the fibula and the calcaneus. In this arthritic case, this is a patient that, uh, of mine who had an infected ORIF of the calcaneus. I didn't do it. Obviously, was not well done to begin with. Totally malreduced, infected, or some Taylor arthritis. <coughs> Doing the weight bearing could make a substantial difference whether you're going to do a distraction bone block arthrodesis. And if you're going to do that, you want to stage it because of the patient's infection, get the infection cleared first, and then go ahead and do a secondary reconstruction. Uh, Charcot is one of the areas that is near and dear to me, and uh, this CAT scan can be very useful to see the alignment here. You see the fibula and tibia sitting about uh, two inches away from the talus. The metamolitis is completely shattered. The entire fossa of the distal tibia is sitting empty, uh, and uh, the talus is extruded essentially uh, medially. So anyway, there's a lot of excitement here. My young uh, researchers and my fellows have all agreed that this is the wave of the future. I think there's a lot of new techniques that will come through this technology. I think like with MRI, once we started to look at it, once we started to explore, once we started to codify what we were seeing, we then were able to learn more clinically, refine our skills clinically, refine our techniques surgically and look at the outcomes in a more predictable fashion. Anyway, there's a lot of excitement with this and uh, the machine is, is quite impressive. It's really well engineered and uh, I think you should check it out. Thank you so much for coming today.